the view. Korean television. This fall, Atari 2600, Aquarius, Apple II, and IBM personal computer. Burger time, only from Mattel Electronics. We are closed now. This is 8-Bit, a channel sharing everything you need to know to make games for the 8-Bit Atari 2600 from 1978. In this episode, we explore how to create and use timers to help generate a stable screen and save us some work. There's a lot to cover here with example code to follow along and try for yourself. So let's get started. As we learned in a previous episode, the Atari 2600 screen is divided into five sections. Vertical sync, vertical blank, horizontal blank, the play field, and overscan. Vertical sync is the period when the TV CRT beam repositions itself after drawing a complete screen. It takes three full scan lines or 228 machine cycles to move the beam from the bottom right to the top left. Vertical blank is the period when the beam is generally above the visible portion of the CRT television. This lasts for 37 scan lines or 2,812 machine cycles. Horizontal blank is the period when the beam is repositioning itself from the end of one scan line on the right to the next scan line on the left. This lasts for about 23 machine cycles for each scan line. The play field is the visible portion of the CRT screen. This is about 53 machine cycles for each scan line. Both horizontal blank and the play field together are generally 192 scan lines in length for NTSC CRTs for a total of 14,000 592 machine cycles. Overscan is the period when the beam is generally below the visible portion of most CRT televisions. This lasts for 30 scan lines or 2,280 machine cycles. I've used the term generally a few times because the number of scan lines you use in each section is up to you. However, the number we're going to follow were recommended by Atari at the time as being the most stable on the most NTSC CRTs. In total, we're generating 262 scan lines per frame, which will give us a nice stable screen. So far in our videos, we've been using loops to count the number of scan lines we're generating, particularly for the vertical blank and overscan. In our loops, we've left them empty with the exception of a WSYNC, which halts the 6507 processor until we started the next scan line. If we've done any additional processing during vertical blank or overscan, we reduce the number of cycles in the loop to compensate. But this is just wasting cycles, and it's hard to keep track of how many cycles you still need to generate for each section. We can make this a lot easier by using timers. The MOS Technology 6532 Peripheral Interface Adapter, or PIA for short, provides the Atari 2600 with its 128 bytes of RAM, the two 8-bit input-output ports, and a programmable interval timer. It's also known as the Riot chip, a mashup of RAM, I.O., and timer. The chip has been used in any number of applications in the 1970s and early 1980s, from pinball machines to disk drives to the Atari 2600. We've already covered RAM and I.O. in previous episodes, so let's look into the programmable interval timer. The PIA has four timing intervals we can choose from. Each one has its own address and the timer is set by writing an interval count of 1 to 255 to that address. The four intervals available are 1 clock, 8 clocks, 64 clocks, and 1024 clocks. If you were to write a count of 1 to the 8 clock interval address, the timer would decrement once for every interval elapsed, so after 8 clock ticks, the remaining interval count would be 0. The PIA and the 6507 microprocessor use the same clock, so the 8 clock interval translates into exactly 8 machine cycles. One PIA timer clock is equal to one 6507 machine cycle. Likewise, if you write a count of 4 to the 64 clock interval address, then the timer would decrement the remaining interval count every 64 machine cycles, eventually reaching 0 after exactly 256 machine cycles. The remaining clocks can be read at any time using the read address shown on the screen. 
When the timer reaches zero, it will hold that count for one interval and then flip the remaining count to 255. Then it begins to decrement the count once each clock cycle. This allows the programmer to determine how many clock cycles have elapsed since the timer ended, up to 255 of course. Now that we know what a timer is, we need to figure out what it can be used for. We know from the beginning of the episode that the vertical blank is 37 scan lines long, or 2,812 machine cycles. Relatively speaking, that's a large chunk of cycles in one place. In previous episodes, we used up these cycles with a basic loop in writing to WSYNC to halt the microprocessor until the start of the next scan line. For any frame setup we were executing, we would have to count the number of machine cycles and adjust the number of scan lines to use in our loop. The more code we had, the fewer scan lines we needed to loop through to ensure the vertical blank period totaled exactly 37. The PIA interval timer can help simplify this by setting a timer, doing a bunch of work, and then checking if the timer has completed. It's a bit more involved than that, but we'll get into the details later. What we know is that we need to count down 2,812 machine cycles using one of the four available timer intervals. We can't use the one clock interval because the maximum interval count you can set is 255, which would only give us 255 machine cycles. We can't use the eight clock interval for the same reason because we would need at least 351 intervals. However, the 64 clock interval only needs 43.9 to cover 2,812 machine cycles. Now that we know what timer to use, let's look at some code. When it comes to timers, there's really not too much code we need to look at. As we see here, we're going to get a timer to handle the vertical blank. We've already calculated that we need 43 intervals of 64 clocks, so we simply load 43 into the register and then store the value into the 64 clock interval timer address. From the moment you write the timer register, it will start tracking clocks which will match up perfectly with our machine cycles. In this bit of code, we're setting the X position of our player graphic, calculating the pointer address to use for the graphic, and then setting a few temporary variables. After that, we'd read the interval timer and then branch back in a loop if the current interval count is not zero. Way down in overscan, we're doing the exact same thing just this time with 35 intervals while we check for input. After, we go into our loop until the current interval count is zero. Then we write to WSYNC to have a nice clean scan line and move on to the next frame. If you found this video interesting, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button and share this episode to let others know. If you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell to make sure you're notified when a new video comes out. If you'd like to help support the development of the channel, please consider becoming a patron. I'll link to that in the description as well. Join us on social media. You can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and occasionally on Twitter. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you later. We can't turn back. River raid target at 039. Roger control. Approaching an airspeed. Way to go. Taking West Canyon. Good call. Fuel critical, sir. Choppers at 3 o'clock. Roger, I copy. Time is closing. Shall I direct something? No, he'll decide that. Fuel critical, sir. He knows that. Sir, sure, he's off for the East Canyon. Negative. That's a trap. River raid to home sweet home. Attending. River raid. Can you make it? River raid, can you make it? It's only a game. River raid for the Atari video computer system. Designed by Carol Shaw for Activision.